Okay, let's pray. Let's get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another week and ask for you to open up your word and reveal yourself to us. Lord, as we uh, cover this subject, which is um, uh, so much, uh, to say that it's essential to Christianity is, is a giant understatement. Uh, as we uh, look into the, <clears throat> the personhood of the second person of the Trinity, uh, we uh, ask for uh, your help to understand it and to um, give you the glory in the truths that are held in it. So, uh, we ask for a quickening of our bodies, keep us alert, keep us uh, attentive, and give us ears to hear what you would say to your church uh, this evening. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us the ability to receive truth for our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, Marianne brought up a question that um, <clears throat> next week is VBS. We are having class. <clears throat> I've been a little on the fence about it, but I, I, um, I want to have the class. Uh, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to do it in the sanctuary. So we'll just meet in that, sort of that front section. You are or you're not? I, don't know. I am. Oh, we okay. are having class on uh, next week. We're just going to meet in the sanctuary instead, because this is going to be turned into, uh, I think, like a penitentiary or something. <laughs> <laughs> something to do with being caged and in prison, and <clears throat> that's the theme, it's made free, so that's sort of been the theme this year. So this is going to be transformed into something else, and the cafe is going to be transformed into something else, and so we're going to do it in the, uh, in the sanctuary. So we should be able to do that. Um, okay, so <clears throat> tonight's topic is Christology, the study of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> and um, which, as sort of alluded to in, in the prayer, I mean, it is the absolute central doctrine of Christianity. Without an understanding of this, and we talk about the non-negotiables, I mean, this is, this is, <clears throat> um, because what we've, what we've talked about so far about the Bible and what we've talked about so far about God, there are a lot of so-called Christian religions out there that will probably agree with us on 90 to 100 percent of what we said so far. This, this is going to be the fork in the road okay, for <coughs> groups like Jehovah's Witnesses, like Mormons, like other Christian-type cults. <clears throat> um, this is this is where they're going to go a different way when we get into this. And so this is absolutely the central doctrine to Christianity. <clears throat> um, and Jesus himself kind of brought this issue up as, as he sat there in Matthew 16 <clears throat> uh, talking to his disciples. And his question to them was, who do you say that I am? And that is, um, you know, that is the central the central question in uh, in true Christianity. On the other side of the equation, <clears throat> um, there are Christians out there that we that we disagree with on many many things, a lot of peripheral things. Some of them pretty strong, <clears throat> but if we're if we're together on this that more than likely we're, we're going to be brothers and sisters of Christ. I sat down at one time, <clears throat> shared your gospel with this guy, and um, I call him super Catholic. This guy was like the most educated Catholic I ever knew. He had like Vatican II memorized, and <clears throat> he, knew, he knew everything. And he was trying to convince me that what, what I was was not a Christian, was not the same as him. <clears throat> and I basically sat there and, and walked him through, what do you believe about Jesus Christ? And everything that I said to him about Jesus Christ, he agreed with. And I said, well, then we're brothers. You know? um, <clears throat> and so, kind of that's why it's such a, it's such a pivotal, central doctrine <clears throat> in Christianity, which our faith is even, in one sense, named after. <clears throat> so it's... it's um, it's vital, and so what we're going to look at 
as you can see, it's, it's just some of the areas that um, that need to be covered is that he was fully God, he was fully man. We're going to talk about his death, resurrection, ascension, and present ministry. <clears throat> um, so, in being fully God, <coughs> oops, <coughs> uh, John 1 1, of course, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And again, as many of you probably know, in the, in the, the um, New World Translation, which is the, the um, Jehovah's Witness Bible, right, it's called the New World Translation, if you didn't know that, <clears throat> they say in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. And that changes the whole doctrine of Christianity. That changes the whole doctrine of who Jesus Christ is. <clears throat> because if he was a God and not the God, then we're not we're not worshiping the same God. <clears throat> right? So John 1:1, 1, 1, and then John further on in John 1:14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among men. Right? <clears throat> Colossians 2:9, in, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the fullness of the God, the entire, everything that God is, dwells within him bodily. Which sounds like a contradiction in term. How can an eternal God dwell within a human body? Well, that's the miracle of the incarnation. <clears throat> uh, we don't know how it is, but this is what our scripture teaches us. <clears throat> Titus 2.13. <clears throat> I'll just read it real quick in turn if you like. Because there's some verses that it's almost like you read through it and you go, okay, and then you read through it again and you go, wait a minute, Paul is really saying something here. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no getting around that. You know, I mean, Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote that he's looking forward to the return of our God, Jesus Christ. So there was no, you know, <clears throat> in early, the early days of Christianity, in, of Christianity, they understood this. They understood <clears throat> that he was fully God. 1 John 5.20 <clears throat> and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an, an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Okay, so... People who want to say, well, he was the son of God. You know, and we hear this a lot among, you know, some Christian denominations who don't really understand. <clears throat> well, was he God? I thought he was the son of God. <clears throat> well, and we'll get to that in a minute, what that means. But even taking that aside, clear statements that he was God. <clears throat> now, um... One of the things is that he claimed to be God. Okay? <clears throat> Matthew 26, 63. They said, they asked him if he was the Son of God. And he said, it is as you said. Now, when he said, when he said, you have said it, <clears throat> that's not him saying, oh, those are your words, not mine. You said it, not me. That's not... That's not what that means in the, in the original Greek, in their, <clears throat> um, in the way that they would say things, it is, it, what he's saying is, is, you have said correctly. You have said rightly. You know, that's just the way they would, you know, even today, sort of colloquially, we, when we want to agree with somebody, we say, you said it. All right, so they're kind of saying the same thing. So when he... When they asked him if he was the Son of God, he said, yes. <clears throat> um, 
In Luke 22, 67 and 71, <clears throat> they asked him again, and he said, yes. And they said, well, we, don't, we have no need for any witnesses. They said, he confessed. He confessed to being equal with God. They said, we don't even need it. They had false witnesses lying all over. And they said, you know, we don't even need these guys. He's confessed to, to being God. <clears throat> John 5, 8, he claimed to be equal with God. John 8, 58, 59, this is another misunderstood verse. Before Abraham ever was, I am. That wasn't bad grammar. That was Jesus making a very definitive statement using the phrase, I am. <clears throat> because of how God introduced himself to Moses. <clears throat> who, who shall I say sent me? Tell them I am sent you. So using that phrase, even in the Greek, he was probably speaking Aramaic when he said it, <clears throat> but using that phrase, before Abraham ever was, I am, they knew what he was saying, and we know they knew what he was saying, because what did they do? They picked up rocks to stone him. They wanted to kill him for blasphemy. You know, they weren't sitting there scratching his head going, what did he mean by that? That's kind of confusing. Like, no, they knew exactly what he meant, because they wanted to kill him for it. <clears throat> John 10, 30, he tells Phil, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And in John 19, 7, they accused him of blasphemy. And what, what is blasphemy but of claiming to be equal with God? And this, <clears throat> um, if you've This is a, a principle that is often considered to be um, brought out by um, C.S. Lewis. But I think it was actually Blaise Pascal who first came up with this because it's sort of a mathematical formula. And if you don't know Blaise Pascal, <clears throat> just look up Blaise Pascal on, on the internet. What a, what a phenomenal testimony. He was a mathematician. He was a world-renowned mathematician way back when. I think back in the days of the Renaissance, and he gave it up to follow Christ. And he, he looked at math, he looked at logic, and he realized there had to be a God, and he, and he gave his life to Christ. <clears throat> and most of you probably know what the trilemma is, right? Which uh, was made popular by C.S. Lewis. <clears throat> which is liar, lunatic, or lord. Okay? Is because the problem you run into is when people say, oh, he was a great teacher, oh, he was a good moral this, oh, he was an example. The problem was he said he was God. Okay? And if he says he's God, now I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to deal with somebody standing before me saying, I am God. And there's only a couple of choices. Okay? Number one, he either is God or he isn't God. Okay, if he is God, well then, he's God. And there he is. Boom. He said, he said he's God, he's God. But if he isn't God, and he's saying he's God, well then I'm left with two options. He's either a liar, a charlatan, someone who's trying to get something over on me, a con man, or he's out of his ever-loving mind. Right? There's really not another option. <laughs> either he is a liar, or a lunatic, or a lord. <clears throat> and this is a great sort of apologetic tool to use for people <clears throat> who say, oh, he was a good moral teacher. They want to lift up Jesus as some great example. And you say, well, wait a minute, though. He said he was God. Now, you have to deal with that, the fact that he said he was God. <clears throat> and you, it's, it's, it, again, it's sort of a mathematical formula. It's irrefutable. Because if somebody else got up and is saying, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus, and we see it in movies and TV shows, people saying they're Jesus, and they're always portrayed as nuts. Or as some kind of a, you know, televangelist, charlatan, cult leader. Right? <clears throat> so, you sort of strip people of that ability to, to soften the edge. And it, and it narrows people down. And that's why it's important that he claim to be God. <clears throat> um, more than that, 
he displayed God's authority. Okay, he forgave sins. And they said, who are you to forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. Matthew 2.20. Mark 14.62. <clears throat> he said that he would sit at the right hand of, the, of, of God. Right? That he would have the power and the authority of God himself. <clears throat> John 5.22. The authority to judge men. John 6.39. 59. And then 10, 17 to 18, he had the authority to raise the dead. Only God could raise the dead. So he displayed God's authority. <clears throat> he possessed God's attributes. So just put these all over once. <clears throat> um... Possess God's attributes. We talked about last week omnipotence, Matthew 28, 18. The power over nature, uh, in Mark 4, 39. Power over disease, in Mark 3, 10. Power over death, as we just mentioned, John 11, 43 and 44. He's omniscient, in Mark 2, 8 and John 2, 25. Um, and again, you know, I, we, I wish we had time to go through all these. That's why I got them up here. <clears throat> we'll just never have time to get through everything if we, if we stop and read all these verses. John 1, 3, he's the creator. Hebrews 1, 3, he's the sustainer of all things. He holds all things together by the word of his power. John 20, 28, he accepted worship. <clears throat> um, and only God can receive worship. Even when, when John bowed down before the angels, they said, no, 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 I'm like you, I'm just a servant. So don't bow down to me. But when, when Thomas bowed down and said, my Lord and my God, Jesus didn't refuse it. So he received worship. And then lastly, one, one more. Oh, this one here. He was sinless. Okay? <clears throat> and, you know, all these are all verses that uh, tell us that he's sinless. I forgot my, on my clock again. <clears throat> only God is without sin okay so he was fully God but he was also he was what <laughs> that was uh, he was back that up so you know what it was <clears throat> 4.15 and then 7.26 no, that didn't come out so the last Hebrews there was Hebrews 7.26 <clears throat> okay, fully man. <clears throat> uh, and it's important because if he was not fully man, then he couldn't represent us. And his death would be meaningless on the cross. Because his death would be meaningless. Because if he wasn't fully man, then he couldn't die. And if he didn't die, then he didn't pay for our sins, and we're still in our sins. So it's very, you know, this, you know, it's one of those things, you start picking at these threads, and there are heresies out there that like to pick at these threads, and you start picking at these threads, and you're going to find out that nothing works unless this is true, unless he is fully God <clears throat> and fully man. Because otherwise, he couldn't, he couldn't pay for the sins of the world if he wasn't man, if he didn't represent us. He couldn't be our head, our federal head, unless he was one of us. So in Hebrews 2, 16 and 18, he's been brought through the human experience and can sympathize with us. Okay, Matthew 1, 8, he was born of a human mother. He had a birth. He didn't just appear somewhere. He, he <clears throat> went through the whole gestation process and was born. Luke 2, 40, he grew as a child and became strong. <clears throat> right, we see him at 12 years old. He didn't just all of a sudden become an adult. He had to grow. He had to learn. He had to learn to walk. Think about these things that, you know, the Lord himself, he had to learn how to walk. He had to, you know, Mary had to change his diaper. You know, he was human. He grew and he learned. Now, certainly uh, of a far greater intellect and, and ability in his 
communion with God than we ever had, but or will have, <clears throat> but still human, having to grow, having to, you know, do things that normal boys do <clears throat> as, the, as they grow up. Uh, and in John 8, 40, he referred to himself as a man. Matthew 4, 2, he was hungry. Matthew, I mean, John 4, 6, he was weary. Matthew 8, 24, he had a need for sleep and refreshment. In Matthew 21, 13, he got angry. And in John 11:35, 35, he wept. He was sad. So he had normal human emotions and appropriate human emotions. It wasn't like, you know, he was some kind of an automaton trying to simulate emotions. He was sad in a sad situation. He was angry in a situation that he should be angry. And so he had <clears throat> um, real human emotions. His humanity was as real as his deity. <clears throat> and he had two natures. And this is, this is where it gets a little, this is where the, you know, the theologians have sort of you know, labored over to try to figure things out, and it's, it's one of those things where you're not necessarily going to see this explained in the scriptures. Uh, it's like the Trinity. It's just assumed. It's, it's there without being, you know, specifically delineated and explained. When you start putting things together, you, you sort of come to this conclusion <clears throat> that he had... Um, that he had two natures within himself. He had a human nature and he had a divine nature. Um, and through the years, the heresies have all tried to emphasize one aspect over the other. Okay? Uh, saying, well, he was a man. He was just fully man, but he was given divine power. Right? Or the, there's a group that was called the Docetists. It comes from a Greek word, doketo, which means appears. And it, that he appeared to be a man. He was really fully God. He only had the appearance <clears throat> of a man. Um, and then some say, well, he was just a moral teacher. He had, he had a divine morality. He was a human being. He was fully human. That's all he really was. But he was given a divine ability uh, in his morality to, um, to speak truth and to be moral. <clears throat> Um, some say that he was a, he had a human body but had a divine brain um, or that he was a man possessed with God that, that he was just a man but God sort of you know took him over and you know it, but, and that they were two separate beings he was a completely separate <clears throat> being <clears throat> but you know in the, in the Nicene Creed they use they use a word Homo Eusius. <coughs> okay, and it is Homo Eusius. And same nature. Substance. Nature or substance. <coughs> um, In talking in this, and they wrote in the Nicene Creed because of the doctrine of Arius. Uh, Arianism had arisen. A man named Arius who was saying that Jesus was a god, that he was a type of, he was godish. You know, he sort of had some godlike qualities. <clears throat> that he was he was a creation. He was a divine deity that was created by the true, by the the you know the real God. <clears throat> um, and so, in dealing with that heresy. In the Nicene Creed, they made sure they, they put in there, he was one with God. He was of the same substance. And not just in the sense of, he had the same kind of nature. Like you and I have the same kind of nature. I, I have a nature just like yours. I have a substance. No, they were of the same substance. Not just the same kind of substance, but the same substance. <clears throat> um, another term you might hear a lot, and again, I just, you know, I put these things out just so that when you, um, when you hear them, you know what it's talking about, okay? A hypostatic union. Has anyone 
ever not, has anybody ever heard of that before? Let's do it that way. Ever heard of hypostatic union? Okay. Hypostatic union comes from a Greek word, upo, stasis, okay? Which means to stand under, okay? <clears throat> now, it's a word that gets, you know, the, 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 the compound structure of the word is a little confusing because what, what does it mean, standing under? <clears throat> but it was a word that was used in common Greek all over, all over the place as the substance of something. It's, it's that which stands under. When you think about it, it's that which is <clears throat> underneath it all, is what it's saying. So it, it became a word that, um, that means the nature, the very nature and substance, the core essence of what something is. And so this union that Christ had, his humanity and his deity were one. They were one substance, one nature, one <clears throat> um, core essence. The two natures were together. While they were two natures, they were of the same substance. And he is of the same substance as God. So it just, when you see hypostatic union, it's talking about that, that union that Christ had between his humanity and his, and his deity. Um, and it's used, in, it's used in, in a couple different places in the Bible, but the most important is in Hebrews 1.3. Actually, we'll just turn there real, real quick. Hebrews 1.3. It says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And that word person there is hypostasis. Okay? That he is the express image of his substance, his nature. <clears throat> so, um, you know, when we talk about his being God and being being fully God and being fully human. He's not schizophrenic. He's not living in two different worlds. He's not half human, half God. He is fully human and he's fully God. Again, it's a concept that, like the Trinity, it can be beyond us a little bit, but when we put everything together, this is what we see explained for us in the Scripture. <clears throat> okay, in Luke 19.10, Now that we've sort of covered the nature of who he is, now comes the question, why did he come? Why, why was he here? Okay. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And then Mark 10.45, Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we have him explaining why he's here. Seek and save the lost, to give his life as a ransom for many. So we're, what are we talking about? We're talking about his death. Okay, the cross of Christ is the central fact of human, of, of, of human history. It is the, the central point in human history as well. You know, we look... Uh, everything prior to the cross is looking toward the cross. Everything in the Old Testament is looking toward the cross. Everything from this point on looks back toward the cross. It is, it is the, the fulcrum, if you will, in, in, in human history. Um, uh, where God did for us what we could not do for ourselves, which is uh, provided a way for each of us to be forgiven. Every, every other religion essentially is a do-it-yourself proposition. The, the cross changed all that. It changed all the rules. That it's, it's not based on something that we've done, but on something that, has, that he has already done. Um, so in just looking at his death, let's just look at the, the, the facts of crucifixion. <clears throat> uh, first of all, it's a Roman invention. It was meant 
for humiliation. It was not just men. I mean, we execute people nowadays, and we try to do it as humanely, as quietly, as you know, painlessly as possible with lethal injection, uh, as a way to to <coughs> without causing undue duress on the person and just putting them out of their misery. Well, this was the exact opposite. This was a, a, a method for humiliation. <clears throat> you know, whenever we see this in the movie, he's wearing some kind of a loincloth. Uh, chances are he was not. People were put on the cross. More than likely, they were put on the cross absolutely stark naked, just to humiliate them. <clears throat> um, it was meant to prolong death. It was not, you know, uh, Paul died of, um, he had his head removed because he was a Roman citizen and he was allowed a merciful death. You know, that was the most merciful way they could think of killing a person because it was quick and, you know, they didn't, didn't suffer long. Again, this was the exact opposite. This was meant to be prolonged. This was meant to <clears throat> be torturously long and a spectacle because it was meant to be a deterrent. It was meant for people to see it and think, okay, this is what happens to me if I, if I mess with the Romans. If I make the Romans angry with me, this is how I end up. And so it was meant as a deterrent. <clears throat> and as most of us probably already are aware, um, it was designed to kill through basically suffocation, through asphyxiation. That in order to breathe as, as he was being hung up there, he was the, all the weight being pulled down on him, the only way for him to take a breath was to lift himself up or to exhale, actually. He could inhale, but he couldn't exhale. The only way for him to exhale was to pull himself up. And when people eventually became too tired too weak to pull themselves up anymore, they would essentially asphyxiate, um, which is, you know, slow and which is basically just drowning um, without water. So, <clears throat> um, the interesting thing about crucifixion is that it was a Roman invention. So it didn't come along until you know, um, first or second century BC is when crucifixion was invented. But yet, it was spoken of in Isaiah 53, 5 to 6. You know, uh, and also in Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is almost an eerie uh, picture of crucifixion. He talks about my bones are out of joint. Right? It pierced my hands and feet. I mean, there's, you know, there's a picture of crucifixion that is clear as a bell in Psalm 22 of something that hadn't even been invented yet, but that was spoken about in the Old Testament. <clears throat> um, and you turn to First Peter. First Peter one. It tells us what this was all about. First Peter one, verse ten. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified before him the sufferings of Christ and the glories that were followed. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. You know, um, it was written for our sakes. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. You know, I mean, we, we, we kind of literally have, have an example in the room here, Bob, if you don't mind me embarrassing you a little bit. I mean, Isaiah 53 played a huge part in, in Dr. Bob's salvation. Um, <clears throat> that you know, he shared, he shared with us that somebody had been sharing that with him, and in, in your in your hearing, it, it sounded like it came from the gospel. I thought it was the New Testament. Yeah, you thought it was the New Testament, and then you realized it was the angry. Old Testament. I got angry. Was that? I got very angry. Yeah. Um, 
So, but that's why it was there. It was there for that purpose, to look forward to what would happen so that when we look back on it, that people would, would say, wait a minute, something's being said here. It was said for our sakes. The, the, the spirit, as it says in First Peter, the spirit of Christ was in the prophets, seeing these things that would happen and making them available to us. <clears throat> so one of the other things that we see is the symbols in the Old Testament okay, of, of his death. Uh, and the Old Testament is, uh, and, and again, you've got sort of an Old Testament scholar in the room here, uh, Bob's son David, who works with Jews for Jesus, and is very, very well versed in the uh, Jewish traditions and things like that. Um, but just, just to hit a couple of them, uh, some of the symbols that we see, the typology in, in the Old Testament, the Day of Atonement in Exodus 30 and Leviticus 16, you know, is, is all about the high priest going in and the fear that he would be killed, that God would not forgive the sins of the people and that he would die in there. And, but he went in all by himself into the Holy of Holies. The only time that they would ever go into the Holy of Holies, one time a year, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and they would make a sacrifice, sprinkling blood on the mercy seat. And we're going to when you and remember that phrase, sprinkling blood on the mercy seat. When we, and when we get into soteriology, we're going to talk about a word. I think we're going to talk about it later on today too. Propitiation. Okay. But sprinkling blood on the mercy seat, which was the space between where the two angels, uh, the two cherubim's wings would cover over, and for that to be a remission of the sins of all the people, starting clean. Because it was done right around Rosh Hashanah, right around the beginning of the year. The beginning of the calendar year. Their spiritual year started back in the spring, the, the, uh, the religious year. But their, the, their sort of civil year started uh, in the fall. And it, it was at that time, the beginning of the new year, you start with a clean slate. And uh, have all your sins forgiven. And Jesus is our high priest. Read the book of Hebrews. Jesus is our high priest who entered into the Holy of Holies and made a sacrifice, his blood, sprinkled in the mercy seat. You know, this, this, the picture is just rich. Um, Passover. Uh, just, again, David has come here and done a thing for us before, if you haven't been here for it, <clears throat> um, and explained how the picture of Passover, the sacrificial lamb, you know, and not not just not just the, the symbolism that's that's in it, but then how it was fulfilled on the very day. You know how on the tenth of Nisan, Jesus would walk into Jerusalem. The tenth of Nisan was the day they would go and get the lamb. All right? Correct me if I'm wrong here. I'm doing all right. Okay. <laughs> and um, you know, and and the day that the lamb would be um, sacrificed. And, uh, and then it goes in, I mean, you get into the bitter herbs, you get into the Afrikoman, there's things within Passover that are just a picture. And what is, what is um, Passover a picture of? It's a picture of when death passed over them. You know, the blood on the lintels of the doorposts, right? The blood of, of, of the lamb painted over that the blood protected them. When death came, the blood protected them from death. And so, you know, Another rich picture. The brazen serpent. Another great picture of Jesus Christ and his death. What's the best one? Jesus said, um, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And, you know, Moses, they were, they were bitten by the snakes. They were dying. <clears throat> and Jesus makes a brazen serpent. You know, what we know today is a caduceus. Now, if you're in the medical field, you know, a little snake, a little snake that wraps around the pole, basically, that's where that got its, its, its birth. <clears throat> because he raised it up and said, if you will look upon the, the brazen serpent, then you'll be healed. You know, and he raised it up on a pole. And there's that picture. Jesus being raised on a pole. If you'll look at him and accept the gift of healing, then you'll be healed. You know, and the word um, uh, 
sozo, and when we get into soteriology, soteria or sozo, uh, in the Greek, it means to deliver, it means to save, and it means to heal. You know, being delivered from a disease. And so, you know, the picture again is the act of faith. And what did they do? They didn't do anything, but it was an act of faith. Moses said, look upon, and look upon the, the serpent and how many... You wonder how many didn't want to look. So that's just stupid. That's, that's just silly. I'm not doing something stupid like that. I'm not getting out of my tent. I'm sick. I'm dying. I'm going to crawl out of my tent to look at some stupid brazen serpent. But how many looked and were healed, were delivered, were saved. And so, and you know, it's it goes on and on and on. I mean, just, just <coughs> the, um, <coughs> the whole sacrificial system is, is a picture of, of Christ's um, death on the cross. Um, so as I said, in the Old Testament, we look forward, they looked forward. They were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the one who would deliver them. Uh, and we look back by faith on what was done. <clears throat> um, the, the animal sacrifices did not save. We see that in, in Hebrews. We really even see it in the Old Testament. You know, God said, I don't, you know, the blood of bulls and goats, you know, they're a stench to my nostril. Because it wasn't, it wasn't the sacrifice that, by which people were saved. Because Old Testament saints were saved the same way that we're saved. By faith. If they practiced these sacrifices out of their faith in God, it was that faith that saved them. Just like Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Well, these people believed God and their act of faith was in these sacrifices. Sacrifices themselves did nothing. They didn't satisfy the justice of God one bit. <clears throat> um, Christ's death was the remedy for sin. It was the atonement in the, in the Hebrew, the kofar, covering. It was, you know, another interesting um, analogy is it was the same. <clears throat> the same word that was that was used for Noah when Noah it says that Noah sealed the I'm sorry when Noah got inside the, the the ark and then God sealed the door. The word sealed is the word kafar. Closed it in, covered it. Right? And it's the same word that's used for the atonement, kafar. <clears throat> so a few terms. few terms to go over when we're talking about uh, the death of Christ. Now we're not, today we're just doing Christ and his death, resurrection, his present ministry. We're not going to be getting into salvation for a few more classes. So we're not going to dive deeply into these things because these things all have to do with salvation. But, the, they, but these terms also relate to the death of Christ, to the sacrifice of Christ. Reconciliation implies a coming together of hostiles. Right? Romans 5, 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. Um, appeasement. And this is that word propitiation. You see that in Romans 3.25 and Hebrews 2.17. It's the removal of wrath. It is satisfying. You know, God, God is saying, God being a just God, is saying, the soul that sins shall die. The wages of sin is death. I must, as a just God, execute my judgment and punish sin. If that is satisfied, if that, that justice is appeased, is satisfied by laying that charge on my son, then I don't have to lay it on their charge. Right? And so that appeasement, that satisfaction, if you will, um, is that propitiation. Uh, ransom. His death was a ransom. Buying back of, of um, uh, or restoring. 1 Timothy 2.6 is a payment that is given uh, 
for a redeemed slave. Okay. Substitution is another element of his death. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he died in our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. He tra traded places with us. So his death was substitutionary. Now, there have been attempts to minimize substitution right there. Before we get to the resurrection, there's been attempts to minimize Christ's death. Some say it's a moral influence issue. That, look, it's just an, it's, it's an example for us. His life was, a, was a, an, an example to us, an influence for us, and that his death, his dedication, you know, was, was meant to influence us. Um, what's called the governmental theory, which is that Christ's death was a demonstration that, you know, God was demonstrating his power of being God uh, to us, uh, sort of as a deterrent against bad behavior. Okay? Uh, another theory is that it was an accident, that, that it was unex an unexpected and unforeseen. Um, except Jesus himself says in John 10, 17, 18, no man takes my life, I lay it down, from, I lay it down on my own. Um, accident theory you see in, in um, a lot of cults. I think the, I know the Moonies, the Unification Church, that's their position. I, think, I can't remember now if it was the, the, um, the Mormons or not. Uh, but you see that in a lot of cults. That, well, he didn't mean to die. It went too far and he died by accident. Uh, another one is that, that he was a martyr. Just a simple martyr. Political statement to rally a cause to get his disciples all worked up. The only problem with any of these things, moral influence, governmental theory, accident, martyrdom, there's no forgiveness of sin in any of those. They're all just sort of a statement of some kind. To, to, to somehow um, impose upon us something. They're not, they don't provide forgiveness. And, you know, and the question that people will ask you when you talk about his, that his death being, you know, um, for forgiveness and that, um, you know, if, if Jesus, if we can get to heaven on, on our own, if we can work our way into heaven, then Jesus died in vain. Right? If, if, if the cross is not the only way to heaven, then why did he die? And, <clears throat> and people will say, well, why can't God just forgive? Why did Jesus have to die? Why do we have to, you know, put our faith in him? Why can't God just forgive? You know, he tells us to forgive. Why can't he just forgive? Um, well, first of all, we just forgive because... We're sinners. So we don't have the right not to forgive. <laughs> We're not in a position not to forgive. You know, we, we, forgiveness is our default position because we need to be forgiven. And so we have to extend forgiveness uh, without condition. <clears throat> uh, God, on the other hand, is not a sinner. God does not need forgiveness. And he desires to offer forgiveness. And we talked about this last week. The problem is that his justice stands in the way. Right? Remember, remember omnipotence? God cannot do what he cannot do. He, he can't be unjust. And if he just winks his eye at sin and says, it's okay, it's not a big deal. We'll just forgive it. Well, then he, he defies his own character. He goes against who he is. You know, God can't just by divine fiat say, well, I'm not just anymore. I'm going to make it unjust because I'm God and I can just do that. Well, then he's not a good God. You know, we talk about God is great, but God is also good. In order to be a good God, he has to be a just God. <clears throat> so, you know, God has to be, um, he has to be consistent with who he is. <clears throat> so the only, you know, and so so Christ was not an innocent victim. Um, be, 
because he was willing, because he went up there willingly. And the only way a person can die, and this is what people will say, people will say, well, how can he die for the whole sins of the world? I mean, one person can't die for the sins of the whole world. He can if he is a person of infinite value, if he is sinless. You know, I can't, <clears throat> I can't pay for somebody else's crime if I'm guilty of the same crime. So it makes no sense, you know, because I, I deserve what I get <laughs> because I committed the same crime. I can't just say, well, you sent me to prison for it anyway. I'll just take his too. No, that doesn't work. In order for you to really pay for somebody else's crime, you have to be innocent of the crime. And not just innocent, you know, in order to pay for the whole world, you have to be of infinite purity and infinite value. <clears throat> so, that's the, the value of, of, of the sacrifice of Christ. Now, and, and we are going to get into some more things about, again, we're just sort of trying to restrict ourselves to uh, Christ himself. When we get into soteriology, that's why it's going to be two classes. Because there's so much to talk about, so we're going to talk a lot more about the sacrifice, the death of Christ, the cross, and all that is going to come into play when we start sort of, we're going to sort of, uh, at one point we sort of reverse engineer salvation, you know, pick it apart, look at the mechanics of salvation and how it works and why, why it works and why it took all these things. So we're going to get into all that. So I don't want to make it seem like I'm just sort of skipping over it and jumping around, but we, you know, we're um, just, we got to, you know, we've got certain things we've got to get through here. So the resurrection. Um, Jesus predicted it, Mark 8, 31, 10, 32, and Matthew 6, 21. Jesus knew in the third day I'll be, I'll be raised. Um, you know, you tear down this temple and I will raise it again in three days. But his, and his resurrection was a bodily resurrection. It was not a spiritual resurrection. Um, I remember growing up as a Catholic, that was sort of the impression that I got, that Jesus sort of, his spirit rose. But no, the, 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 you think about his, his human body lay in that grave, cold, the cessation of all, you know, uh, biological matter, the cessation of all cellular activity, everything stopped, brain waves stopped, heart not beating, everything that we call dead, right? Beating again, blood flowing again, brain wave activity. All that stuff being being uh, not just resuscitated, but resurrected. <clears throat> he ate fish, Luke 24, 39. Okay? If he was a spirit, he's not going to be eating physical fish. Uh, Thomas touched him, John 20, 27. Uh, but he was different. He could walk through walls and he could kind of move from this place to that place, appear one place, disappear. You know, transport himself. But it was still a bodily resurrection. The benefits of the resurrection are really for us um, is that, that second. number one, it validates and confirms the truth of Christ's life. The fact that he said he would be raised again. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. It validates his life. If he says all these things and then dies and he's gone, then he's just another guy who talked a good game and he's gone. You know, we talk about this all the time. Muhammad, dead. Buddha, dead. All these, all these religious leaders, they're all dead. None of them came back. He came back. You know, if he just dies and never comes back, then he's just another guy in another belief system. This validates everything that he said about himself. It is also, for our sakes, in John 14, 19, uh, it is the guarantee of our resurrection. He is the first fruit. Yeah, really? Right now, this is, gonna be <coughs> this is my life device. It's a computer sometimes. Do these restarts. <coughs> um, so the, guar the guarantee of it. He went first. The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead means that's our promise that will be raised from the dead. Uh, and the other thing that it does is, is, interestingly enough, is it deals with, 
it deals with the heresy of Gnosticism. Okay? Um, Gnosticism says anything that's spiritual is good, anything that is physical is inherently evil. Right? This is, and this is a doctrine that, that permeated Christianity in the early years. That it's sort of Gnosticism means knowledge, a higher knowledge. We have, we have a greater knowledge. We understand that what we see around us, it's all evil. The only thing that's good in us, the only thing that even has any goodness in us is our is our the, is our immaterial part, our soul. You know, and it is all good. Spirit is all good, and physical is all evil. Well, we're going to be raised, and Jesus was raised physically, and we're going to be raised physically. So physicality is not by nature evil. And spirituality is not by nature good. There is evil spirit. There are things in our soul that are sinful and evil, that are not part of our flesh. Um, and there are things that in our flesh that are not inherently evil. So um, it, it, it flies in the face of, in the face of uh, Gnosticism. And the last thing is, is Christ's present power, that he is alive. You know, we serve a living God. We don't serve, you know, a, um, a dead God. We don't serve uh, a, an image, a memory. He is alive. And, and he has a present ministry, which we're going to get into. And that's, that's the, um, the importance that, that he is still alive is that it's not we're just honoring his memory and we're honoring his doctrine and we're just taking his teachings and we're trying to be followers of his teaching. He's alive. He is our present king. You know, and our present and living king. Now, some false theories about the resurrection. Uh, the first is what's called the swoon theory, which is an impossibility. The swoon theory says basically he fainted. He feigned death on the cross. He passed out. And they took him down thinking he was dead, put him in a cold tomb, and somehow he came out of it. Um, a lot of problems with this. Number one, if you take somebody who was that close to death and you put him in a cold, damp tomb, that'll pretty much seal the deal. Not to mention the fact that they wrapped him up so he wouldn't be able to breathe. Right? And they so stabbed him in the side didn't help either, right? Was that Stabbing in the side didn't do much. Well, for him yeah, either, yes, right? and that was the other thing. That's the other thing is that they tested to see, okay, is he dead? Stick him in the side. The, the, the hemoglobin and the plasma come out. The separation of the, you know, uh, of the, the the blood, the blood and the water. Um, the, the the Romans were very efficient at killing people. So if they say somebody's dead, if, you know, you can pretty much count them that they're dead. If they're not going to die in that tomb. Um, the other thing about the problem with the swoon theory is that, look, if he did, if let's just say he did, um, and somehow he managed to get out of that tomb, which was sealed with a giant rock with a bunch of guards in front of it, okay, let's just say all that is true. When he comes out, what's he going to look like? I mean, you take somebody who's been beaten and bloodletted and stabbed and, and hung on a cross, you don't look at him and say, wow, he's been raised from the dead. You say, my God, I can't believe he's still alive. <laughs> and look at him, he, does, he barely looks like he's alive. So they wouldn't, the, the disciples wouldn't have been impressed with him raising from the dead. He wouldn't have looked a resurrection. It would have looked like, you know, death warmed over if, if he had made it. Zombie. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> um, uh, next is that it was a hallucination. You know, that, that the disciples only thought they saw him. And they, they, they um, had what was called a mass hallucination. But they all wanted it so much that one person said, look, it's the Lord. And they all said, yes, it's the Lord. And they all joined in the hallucination. Well, the problem with that is two things. One, mass hallucination is not even really a thing. And number two, they didn't believe that he was going to be raised from the dead. They weren't expecting him to be raised from the dead. They didn't get it until after he appeared. 
So they weren't hoping it so much. They weren't hoping in the resurrection so much. They had no idea that he was going to be raised from the dead. So they, there's no way that their hope would have spurned this, this, this hallucination. Um, the stolen body, that he did die, he did, wasn't raised, that the disciples just happened to uh, overpower uh, a bunch of Roman guards, push back a giant stone, and take the body away without them. And that was the theory that was given. Oh, well, we were asleep and they came and stole them. You know, the, you know, the problem with that um, is that they all died as martyrs. You know, that if that's a hoax, then, you know, people will die for what they believe, but they're not going to die for what they don't, what they know is a hoax. You push them hard, but they say, okay, okay, yeah, give. Yeah. All right, look, we just, this was Peter's idea. And, you know what I mean? They're going to, someone's going to cave. Someone's going to dime somebody out and, you know, knowing that it's a hoax. But they all died as martyrs. They all went to their death, believing that it was true. And, you know, and one of the things with the hallucination theory as well, is just the idea that they just made it up. They, that he wasn't raised from the dead, they just decided to make it up. If that were true, then they would have kicked open the grave and they would have dragged his body through the streets to, to shut the whole thing down. They're going around, he's raised from the dead, he's raised from the dead. Okay, let's show you what this raised from the dead looks like. And they would have dragged Jesus' body through the streets to prove to everybody that, you know, that he wasn't raised from the dead. And the account in the Gospels itself said the body was missing. That they said, well, he must have, they must have stolen him. So the body was not in the grave. You know? Um, <clears throat> the last thing we're going to look at tonight is ascension. Forty days later, forty days after his resurrection, Acts one nine through eleven, uh, he ascends unto the Father, and and, and, and John fourteen thirteen, it's, he goes before us. You know, he told them, I, "I'm going to be going ahead of you, and I'm going to be preparing a place for you." He's and he's and, and after he went, the angel said, "You know, why do you stand here, a gazing?" That Jesus, who you who you've seen leave, and will return to you in, in same in the same manner. Um, so he goes before us, and in Hebrews four sixteen, because he goes before us, and in bodily form, he didn't just, you know, it said he ascended, he rose from the ground. He didn't just dissolve into thin air. Physically, his body was raised into heaven, and. He sits as our intercessor and he gives us access to the Father. He can sit as our mediator. <clears throat> it says he ever lives to intercede for us, to make intercession for us. He is, he is alive. He didn't just vanish. Uh, his physical body still exists. Now his present ministry... Again, is intercession for us. And his present ministry is on earth. You know, in, in, in um, John 16, he tells us that I, if, I have to leave. Because if I don't leave, then I can't send the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and if he sends the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And what is Christ's ministry today? It is through the body of Christ. That's why it's called. That's why Paul, through the Holy Spirit, wrote that it is one body. That we are the body of Christ. Because we are his hands and feet. We are his present ministry. His present ministry is through his church. The ministry of God uh, prior to the cross was through the Jews. That was his way of reaching the world. Was I have a special people. And I want everyone to look at them and see how special they are and how I treat them and how different they are from everybody else and all the things and the rules and the rituals that I give them they, they make them different from everybody else. And that's why, and it's amazing because he, he says, I want you to be so different, I want you to be special. And they said, we just want to be the same. 
We just want to be like everybody else. We don't want to be so different anymore. And that was their downfall. They wanted to be like everybody else. They wanted to worship all the gods of everybody else. They wanted to do the same things as everybody else. But God wanted them to be special. That was his ministry. Right? Then Jesus had his ministry on earth, revealing God through himself. Now that he has ascended, he has sent his Holy Spirit to dwell within his people, within his church, so that we become his ministry. That now he, he expresses himself to the world through his church. And that, that, is, that is the methodology that he uses to, um, you know, to reach people, to, <clears throat> to administer the gospel, to reveal himself to the world. You know, we, we often say that, that, that Christianity is only uh, one generation away from extinction. Because if we don't do what we're called to do, then it's over. And that's why, you know, our ultimate reason for being here is so that we can tell people about Jesus, so that we can reveal who the Father is um, through, because that's Jesus' Jesus's job, as we talked about the Trinity, right? Jesus' job is to point to the Father. The Holy Spirit's job is to point to Jesus. So we have the Holy Spirit within us, getting us to point to Jesus so that Jesus can point to the Father as we do the work of Christ that he's given uh, for us to do. So that is uh, Christology. We actually got done a decent time this week. Uh, so next week we're going to be doing pneumatology and angelology, um, not because they are in any way related to one another, but just because angelology is, is kind of a small topic. And we've covered so much of the Holy Spirit so far, so there's only a few things to talk about the Holy Spirit. So we're going to do pneumatology and angelology. So just look for that. Like I said, it's not, we're not teaching in the order in the book. So you're looking at chapter 6 and chapter 8. Okay? For next week, chapter 6 and chapter 8, the Holy Spirit and angels. Satan and demons. Um, and we are meeting next week. We're going to be meeting in the sanctuary. There may be a, a week coming up in July, mid to late July, maybe even early August, depending on what happens. That I may not be here, so we may have to skip a week. Um, but we will be here next week. Any questions? I do. Thank you for reminding me. Because this is just something, this is something for you. This is not anything necessarily. Uh, this is not anything terribly informational. It's a little bit more inspirational. Uh, but I'll tell you, this. And many of you probably already have this. This is that one solitary life. If you don't already have it. Then take it, you know, read it through. And uh, fold it up and stick it somewhere and pull it out every once in a while. When I was uh, saved, early on, but being very carnal, the first two years, I would tell people I was saved for the fire insurance. Because I got saved and then said, okay, now I'm going on with my life um, as a teenager. It actually got a little worse. I was almost sort of a clean cut, well behaved kid until I got saved. And then, you know, <laughs> Satan took me and made me do stupid stuff. I have a comment. I think sure. Many years ago, I did a Bible study about 1 John, the first verse, 1 John, or mm -hmm. of John, Gospel of John. Yeah. And it says, in the beginning was the word, you know, and it's translated logos. But this particular study, the guy said, what's the one word that rabbis won't say? And that's Jehovah, Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So the guy says what that really should be translated in the beginning was Yahweh, and Yahweh was God, and Yahweh became flesh. Now, it's not in stone, but I thought I'd bring that up. Well, and, said, and, that's and, the word the rabbis won't say. You know? It might have been if it was written in Hebrew. 
Aramaic. Awesome. But it was written in Greek. What's the thought? So, it's a thought. And, it's the one word and the logos the was a the logos was a thing in Greek philosophy, and the logos was sort of a a uh, in Greek philosophy was sort of that phenomenon of of um, sort of the summation of truth, the summation of all that was true and right and and pure was called the logos, the, the spoken word, you know, and that was a, a, a principle in, in Greek philosophy. And so, um, you know, again, through the Holy Spirit, the Apostle John used that word, you know, in the beginning was the logos, the, the summation of all that was pure and holy and right and true. And, uh, and then, you know, then we sort of, verse 14, we get the peek into who the logos was. As you read through it, we sort of, don't know who the logos is, who the word is, until you get to verse 14. But um, and it may have been. I mean, it's, it's like yeah, it's said, a possibility. Because it's, it's, uh, it was written not to very Jewish people to, yeah. to read, and that was the one word they wouldn't use. They wouldn't say Yahweh or Jehovah. Yeah. So anyway, there was there was a time when I'll just be, I'll be transparent with you guys. You know, I was a teenager, and I just was. Being stupid, I was saved. I went to a party and had a little too much. And I'm sitting there, and this this one guy, you know, we all were a little pretty heavily inebriated. And this one guy said, "Hey, you're you're friends with that guy, Vinny. This is the guy that led me to the Lord. You know, that that guy's like a religious nut or something." And I started defending my friend. And in defending my friend, I started sharing the gospel. You know. And in sharing the gospel, this one kid's like, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I heard him. I've been, you know, he was taking CCD classes, you know, for, in, in, Catholic, in the, the Catholic Church. He's like, yeah, that sounds like the stuff I've been learning in my CCD class. And I started sharing the gospel with him. And then he pulls out, he goes, yeah, they gave me this thing. And he pulled that out. And I read it. And it blew me away. I had never read it before. And I, it blew me away that, you know, who this man was that seemingly an insignificant man. In, in the grand scheme of all the men that have ever lived, there's nothing that he did in his humanity, if you will, that seems significant enough for him to have made any kind of impact on the world. But yet he has become the foundation for civilization, you know, uh, and, and has impacted this this world greater than any life that has ever lived, you know, and, and I read it and it blew me away, and the, the testimony of this was that I instantly became sober, and I left that party, and, I, and, I, and, and that, was, that was sort of a turning point for me, that I realized, you know what, I need to take this seriously, this faith stuff seriously, and, and it sort of began to <clears throat> launch from that point. So this this little poem, if you will, if you want to call it that, uh, just has a, a personal thing on me, but it's I think it's something that we should all just know and, and take stock in. <coughs> the influence that that one man has had on you know really the universe. Any other questions, comments? Alright, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for Sending us your son, Father, for the, for the truth of, of who Christ is and, um, and all that he has done to impact not only the world but our lives uh, for our sakes and not for his own. And so, Father, we, uh, we give you all glory and praise uh, for the, the price that you paid in offering up your own son for our sakes to satisfy your justice so that you can pour out your love and mercy and forgiveness. And so uh, bless us now as we go. Let these words uh, sink deep into our spirit and, um, and be transforming power for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.